This is always the lesson the Sunday after Easter, the lesson that we talk about doubting Thomas. I don't know if we do that because we doubt anybody's going to come this Sunday after Easter. Like I said, we call it Low Sunday. But I think it's a story that needs to be looked at once a year at least. Now, let me tell you a story about my ministry when I started. I spent the first six years of my ministry in deaf ministry. Part of that time as pastor of the Maggot, the United Methodist Church of the Deaf in Pasadena, Maryland. Anybody ever been to Pasadena, Maryland? It's a suburb of Glen Burnie, which says a lot right there. Now, I was also the chaplain at St. Elizabeth's Hospital in Washington, D.C. for the deaf patients there. So I had deaf psychiatric patients part of the week, and then I had the deaf congregation the rest of the week. It was getting to be really hard on me, even though I was in my 20s then, to go back and forth and do that kind of ministry. The bishop said, I want Terry just to focus her efforts on the deaf church, and we'll have somebody else do the hospital for her, which meant someone with an interpreter, because there weren't many pastors who signed in those days. But my superintendent didn't like that because he had one of the highest payouts of apportionments in the entire nation in the United Methodist system. So he gave me a second church, take two there, small, a little bitty church in Pasadena, Maryland that was a hearing congregation. I knew I was in trouble the first time I met them when a woman came in up to me and said, I pick the hymns, I pick the hymns. She also typed the bulletins and used carbon paper to do it because there were only 18 people there. If you can imagine a carbon paper bulletin, by the time you got to the 18th copy, it was a little smeary. But it was an interesting little place. Twelve of the nicest, no, twelve of the craziest people you'd ever want to meet and six of the nicest people you'd ever want to meet all in one group. Now, they were a little upset with me because when I got there, they told me what they wanted me to do. They wanted me to go out and get people to come to church. So I went out, I was young, I was enthusiastic, I knocked on doors. People looked at me like I had two heads when I knocked on their door and said, we'd like you to come to church. Because this is a place where most people had motorcycles and all sorts of crazy stuff going on in Pasadena and the neighborhood we lived in, it was a very poor neighborhood. But people started bringing their kids to church. Then suddenly I'd be standing there on Sunday morning. It was a building that people thought was a car garage because it had a flat roof, it was a little tiny, crazy looking place. And I would be standing in the pulpit doing the service, and somebody would be knocking at the front door. I'd say, is anybody going to get that? Nobody would move, and I'd go down and unlock the door and let people in. Every Sunday, every Sunday. I'm not making this up. You're looking at me like I'm making it up. And I finally said, why are we locking the door on Sunday? And the man who ran everything in the church, everything. He's got to be with Jesus now, or he'd be 138 years old. But he looked at me, and he said, we're tired of all these strangers coming here. I said, strangers? We call them visitors. He said, nope, they're strangers. At the next council meeting where everybody came, all 12 of the crazy people, see, I'm not going to tell stories about this about you when I leave here because I'm going to retire after this church, so <laughs> you're all safe, and you don't do things like this, right? But I said, you told me you wanted people to come to church. I went out and knocked on the doors, and I got people to come to church, and they said to me, literally, I'm not making this one up. We wanted better people than the ones you got. We wanted better people than the ones you got. Hold on to that thought when we look at this passage, okay? Because we're talking about being locked out or locked in. Now here's the question that confounded the first service. I'll ask you all. When it comes to the tomb before Easter morning, when that stone is there, was Jesus being locked in or were others being locked out? Do, 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 do. I do that a lot, don't I? How many of you think it was to lock Jesus in? How many of you think it was to lock the others out? How many of you are thinking I've lost my mind? <laughs> okay, I'll go with that one too. Now, look at this story that we just read. The Jews are locked in to the room for fear of the other Jews. The disciples are locked in because they're afraid that what happened to Jesus might happen to them. They've locked themselves away in fear other than Thomas. And Jesus does what? He shows up. He does not need the door to be open or unlocked. He does not need a welcome mat. He doesn't need anything. He's just there. I love this about Jesus because he's done that in my life many times. Would you agree with that? That he is no longer bound by the dimensions of time and space, no longer bound by the laws of physics. You need him and he's there. And the disciples are scared and he is there. So I don't think that stone was put in front of the tomb to lock him in or to keep him from getting out. 
the stone was put there to keep people from stealing his body because that's what those doubters thought was going to happen. Not Thomas the doubter, but the people who said he is not who he says he is. They thought the stone was put there. They made sure it was sealed up tight so they couldn't come and steal his body and claim that he had been raised from the dead because what had he said to them before? The Son of Man must suffer at the hands of the Sanhedrin and the Romans and be put to death and on the third day rise again. They didn't want anybody to think he was just risen because they knew that they'd steal his body, so they put that stone there. But Jesus didn't need the stone to be moved to get out of the tomb, did he? Because they opened the tomb and it's empty. The tomb was open so we could look in and see that he wasn't there and believe. So we have Thomas here, don't we? I hate calling him Doubting Thomas because Thomas is the one who earlier in this gospel has said when Jesus says, let's go to Jerusalem, and they said, don't go there. Herod's waiting to kill you. And what does Thomas say? Let's go die with him. That's not the, that's not the voice of doubt there, is it? But Thomas in John's gospel, just the night before Jesus is killed on the cross, when Jesus says, you know the way I'm going, I'm going to prepare a place for you, and Thomas says what the others are thinking, he has the courage to say, we got no idea what you're talking about, Lord. We don't know where you're going. How can we follow you? And Jesus says, you know the way. And he said, how can we know the way? What did Jesus say? You know this one. I am the way and the truth and the life. That's who Thomas is. And he's not locked up like the others for fear, is he? He's out there. I don't know if he's on a reconnaissance mission. I don't know if he's trying to gather information. I don't know what he's out doing. Maybe he's getting something to eat. But this is Easter evening. They're still the same day of the resurrection. The women have come to them and said, he's been raised. And they said, they thought it was an idle tale, which is the way in the first century of saying, honey, you're crazy. You've lost your mind. Be quiet. Don't say these things. The women were taken as not having any authority to speak the truth. A woman in the first century couldn't be used as a witness in a trial because she was considered to be an irreputable witness, an unreliable person. And so they look in the tomb and they see it's empty and then they go and they hide. They still can't believe but we're going to call Thomas the doubter. So Thomas comes back and they say, we've seen the Lord. They're so excited. How did they know it was him? He showed them. They didn't have to ask. He shows them. He holds out his hand. He says, touch me. See that I've been wounded, and it's me. And they believe, and they say, we've seen the Lord. Thomas says, unless I see him for myself, I will not believe. And then Jesus comes again, knowing what Thomas has said, and goes to Thomas and says, here, touch me and see that I'm real. See that it's me. And Thomas is the one who proclaims, my Lord and my God. My Lord and my God. My God. He understands fully who Jesus is now. We don't know how long it took them to get out of that room, do we? Because we'll read a story next week where they go back to fishing again. We don't know how long it took them to figure out what Jesus said to them when he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. This is what we call the little Pentecost story here. Because he breathes on them and he says, receive the Holy Spirit. If you retain the sins of any, they're retained. If you forgive the sins of any, they're forgiven. What authority he gives to these people who had denied him, deserted him, and betrayed him. He gives them authority to forgive sins. Still, they're locked away. And he says the words to Thomas that speak to us. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. And that's us. That's us because we haven't seen for ourselves. We haven't touched his side. We haven't seen the wounds in his hands. And yet we have come to believe. But I'm here to tell you, we can lock Jesus away and we can lock others out. We can lock people out of the church, can't we? Like the people literally locked out of the church in Pasadena, Maryland. They were locked out completely because they didn't live up to someone else's expectations. How else can we lock people out of the church? I think we do it a lot of times by our judgment, don't we? It's very difficult to come into church if you feel like you're being judged. Lots of times we judge people because they're divorced. We judge people because they have children and they're not married. I've always said, and I will continue to say, that one of the leading causes of abortion is the Church of Jesus Christ. I used to work with the Conference Council on Youth Ministries, and I worked with two young women from the same congregation. One of them ended up pregnant. Oh, horrors. If you haven't known anyone who had a child without being married, you are in the minority. And... Some women in the church wanted to give her a baby shower because she had nothing. And other women said, if we do that, they'll all want to get pregnant so they can all have a shower. No, that's not how it works. 
The worst mistake you ever make in your life is to bring another human into the planet. You've done a good job. Let me tell you that right now. She had a college scholarship, and she gave it up to raise her baby. Dad took off. He didn't want anything to do with her, but she kept her child and raised her child and worked three jobs to support her baby. The next year, another girl from the same congregation ended up in the same situation. She had an abortion because she knew what the first one had gone through. Judgment can keep people locked away from Jesus, can't they? Hypocrisy. One of the reasons that young people have fled the church is because what we preach is not what we practice necessarily, is it? And just not getting a welcome when you come in. The best analogy I've heard of walking into a church for the first time as a stranger is going to your spouse's high school reunion if you didn't go to the same school. Because everybody says, oh, it's so nice to meet you. What do you do? And then they turn back and they catch up to the people that they know they haven't seen in a while. Lots of things we can do to keep people locked away from the church. But we can keep Jesus locked away as well, can't we? Not with a stone, not with a door lock, but when we keep our mouths shut, when we don't share the faith that we have in Christ. It's hard sometimes. You don't want to come off as somebody who's judgmental. We shared a little bit this morning, and people were saying about how hard it is to share if you don't know the person's faith that you're talking to. You don't want to seem like you're judging them. But we all have to find ways to share our faith without sounding like we're judging. The story I've told so many times is when I was a student at Towson, which used to be Towson State University, it used to be Towson State Teachers College, but it became Towson State University the year I started, 1976. I believe that's the year Mike Gillespie was born, isn't it, Mike? Yep. I was in college when he was born. Scary thought, huh? But I was sitting in the student center studying. Two people from the Campus Crusade for Christ walked up to me and said, are you saved? I said, yes, thank you, went back to reading. They said, how do you know you're saved? I knew they wanted the phrase that pays, which is because I've accepted Jesus Christ as my personal Lord and Savior. Now, if you think I'm stubborn now, I was really a lot more stubborn then. I asked my mom, right, mom? And I wasn't going to say that. So they said, how do you know you're saved? I said, because I have a Savior, Jesus Christ. And they said, we'd like you to come to a Bible study so you can be saved. I said to them, I go to Bible study every week. And they said, really? You go to Bible study where? I said, at my church. You go to church? Yes, I'm a Christian. I go to church. What church do you go to? And I said, Frames Memorial, United Methodist. They looked at each other and went, oh. And they said, we'd like you to come to a Bible study so you can be saved. Let me tell you, the United Methodist Church doesn't save anybody. I don't save anybody. Jesus Christ is the Savior of the world, right? I am his cheerleader. I am his cruise director. I am the one who tries to get people to him, but I don't save anybody. And neither does the phrase that pays. We have to find ways to speak of our faith that do not turn other people off. Saying, are you saved, is not a good entry. Going to somebody saying, I once was lost, but now I'm found... That is a good way to start. Say to somebody what Christ has done for you. I asked last week, I asked the question, what is saving you right now? And a couple of people raised their hand and bravely spoke. I want you to get to the point where you can talk to people about your faith openly. Start with your family. Practice at home. But then, that's why we're doing Mother's Day the way we're doing it this year. I want some people to stand up here and talk about the women who influenced your faith life. You can do it. If you're afraid you're going to trip over your tongue, look at all the times I have tripped over my tongue up here and the things I've said and the mistakes I've made. People are afraid to read the Bible out loud because they're afraid they won't know how to pronounce the words. Let me tell you, nobody knows what they're supposed to sound like anyway. So if you make a mistake pronouncing the Zerubbabel or Baal or something like that, nobody's going to know anyway. But be brave. Be a liturgist like Linda. She's got a stool up here she can stand on. We'll put you on a stool or we'll lower the microphone or raise it for you. We need to get better at sharing our faith so we're not like the disciples who are locked away in fear. Or worse yet, we're not like the ones who locked Jesus up so that no one can get to him. Because let me tell you, he will come to you when you need him. He will be there for you. He will walk through any wall, any stone, any lock to get to you. We need to be that way with others. Let me ask you this. What's our new mission statement? We say it every Sunday through Lent. Our mission is to Our mission is to love God with what? 
to love others as and to make that can be an ethical process for everybody here. Do the words you speak, does your attitude toward others, does it show your love for God? Does it show that you love God with your whole heart? Does your attitude toward other people, even the ones you disagree with, even the ones you think are sinning, even the ones you think are really messing up, does your attitude and your words and your actions toward them show that you love others as God loves you? And does everything we do make disciples for Jesus Christ? That's how we fling the doors of this church wide open. That's when people will come to Christ in floods because they will know that they are welcome, that they are loved, that they can be forgiven, that there is grace and peace and welcome. You ever lock yourself out of your house or your car? How do you feel then? Pretty miserable, isn't it? Don't let that happen to anybody on your watch. The glory of God and our Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. I invite you now.